Um, I think what I'll do though is, is just very briefly start by saying a little bit about who I am and the organisation I work for and something about the area because whatever, whatever I'm going to talk about, I think it does cross over with the, the, the last two presentations and I think there's, there's some really interesting stuff there that I certainly would like to follow up on. But um, the geography and our role in that area is really what sets everything that I'm going to, to, to say just now about the way that we've approached creative industries, how we try and work with the sectors and, um, and the, how we measure things. Um, first thing then is the Highlands and Islands Geographically, it covers half of Scotland, but it's kind of important to realise that population-wise, we're not even close to being half of the country. Um, we have one city. Everything else is split up into small areas. 90 inhabited islands, which seems incredible, is in this patch. So it's an area bigger than Belgium, and yet um, and half of the land mass of Scotland. But we don't actually get noticed in quite the same way. So one of the first measures that we put on everything is, and especially in the support we're putting out, is how do we make sure that when something's being done Scotland-wide or being talked about for Scotland, <coughs> it actually means Scotland and not the central belt and the urban centres. Most research around creative industries focuses on ur urban centres. Um, most of the, fair enough, most of the activity probably happens in that. But we want to make sure that we're actually covered. So our first measure, as I said, is make sure that anybody providing support and help is actually getting themselves noticed um, is on steering groups or any kind of uh, anything there, which is just about reminding people that the Highlands exist and that we're, we're, we're there and doing a lot of interesting work and have a lot of interesting people to work with, despite the population size. I think the other thing that's important with this is that it sets up some very specific other challenges. One is about the geographic location, is about how far from the perceived urban centres, the perceived creative centres we are. Also, um, the importance that creative industries actually hold in rural areas and the more remote areas. So if we take the, the inhabited islands, the island of Egg has a population of 76 people and yet almost 70% of them earn their living out of creative industries. And in actual fact, what we're finding is that we're seeing young people actually moving to the island because of that and getting involved. So one of the newest folk to move there was a guy, Johnny Lynch, who I'm sure some of you will have come across with the Fence Collective. It's a music business. He now runs a label, Lost Maps. He runs a festival on the island. He runs events in other parts of the place. But he's based and, and runs his business from the island of Egg. So it, it really what we're talking about there is about What's the message that people are picking up? How are they looking at the area and what the benefits can be, even if you're not tying into some of the more obvious links of, of having the, 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 the urban setting around you and the, and the people around you? We are the social and the economic development agency for the Scottish Government covering that area. So the first thing that we, we have is our definition that we, we work with of what we're actually talking about, about economics and cultural and about the, 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 the world that we're looking at. And this is, this is the area that we're working in. And initially, that provides some real challenges on how you measure the impact of what we're doing and even how you, you target the ambitions of what people are doing. We're, if, if you want to break it down, we're there to deliver, deliver the government's economic strategy. We're not necessarily there to help people. It's about delivering that economic strategy. On the other hand, we want to make sure that it applies to the area and that people do benefit from it and we see growth not only in terms of the economy but the population and sustainability for people, particularly for those living in the more fragile areas. So we initially though we run into areas that have challenges over cultural and economic returns and how do you define the two, how do you get the best values and also the danger then of, of making the two things linked up too closely so that you end up with ambitions being set for business that just don't match up. So a social enterprise's ambition could be very different from a very small software company or a games developer or a music business. There, there will be crossover but they don't necessarily match exactly. Um, the Creative Scotland um, is another example that, that uses the triple bottom line approach to this one, where they're looking at um, 
the, the social impact, the cultural impact, and the economic benefits to, to something. Now, that's great in many ways, but there are still real challenges around those and, uh, and, and how, what the impacts of those will be. For one thing, as I said, you do end up with a mixture of ambitions and what you're trying to achieve through it. But probably the most difficult one to, to look at in that is that if you're talking about a business and you take in cultural value in, that, in the form that they, they have been, you run the risk of actually putting somebody in a cycle where they go for funding, they deliver the project, and then they come back for funding. And they keep going round and round that process because, the, because of the impact of the, the, the cultural valuation that's put on it. When, if we're talking about the businesses, we want to remove them out of that circle. We don't want them to be coming back for funding again. We want them to be making their business out of it and becoming more sustainable themselves without having to come back into that process. So there are real challenges, as I said, in, in how you would look at this one. I'm not going to, to say anything about the to you because I mean you guys I'm sure are well well savvy on what's happening in terms of how consumption patterns have changed the impacts of technology but there's a couple of points here that I think really do matter uh, in terms of what, what I'm going to look at next the the first one is around young people and it's not so much um, this is Henry Jenkins at MIT came up with this quote in about 2003 um, which shows it's been the ideas have been around for a while but it, it's even more pertinent today, if anything. And it's not about the number of screens they use. It's not whether digital is the important thing or not. It's about the, the, the way that young people are consuming things and are actually looking to gather information themselves. That just going and accessing the inform um, information or film or something that's being handed to them isn't really good enough anymore. They're looking for a bit more out of it than that. So um, this interaction with the engagement with the producer of, of a product, whatever it might be, is core and central to the way the producer needs to be looking at, at, at their work and also how they're going to engage and encourage the consumers to actually take that step through from engaging with them to taking an action, which might be to buy a ticket, might be to buy the product, it, whatever you're trying to, to drive them to. The other part here, um, if we look at that triangle down at the bottom, this consumption pattern and the, the, the integration of people into this also has two levels within it that we, you need to take into account as well. The top part of the triangle, that's all the people that actually directly engage. They want to be online, they want to be sending messages in, talking to the business. They want to be saying, this is what we think, here's what we like about it, here's what we don't like. But you've also then got a huge number of people sitting underneath that who want to see the engagement. They don't necessarily want to engage themselves directly, but they w the engagement is part of the process that they're buying into. So that actual process of engagement is just as important in many ways as your direct engagement with, with consumers. I hope that makes some kind of sense. I think I'm waffling a little bit there, but I hope you, you see my point. The other part to this comes back to the story itself. And again, these are things that have cropped up in the last, this is something that's coming up in the last two presentations. Um, in the past, meaning was allocated very much by Hollywood, big films coming out of there, um, re big record labels, you know, these major multinational companies decided what was good and bad in the world, what you ought to like, what you don't want to like. But that's changed because the opportunity there for any small business is to actually assign meaning themselves if they know how to go about it and to effectively use the, um, get their story out. To get the story out effectively, you need to also understand that it has to be much wider than a single platform or single product. And if we start to, so on this one, it needs to be things that people engage with every day. So you need to be, businesses need to be thinking about how they're engaging on social media, but it's also what are the other kinds of products and services that they need to tie in that people will pick up on. And this will become a little clearer as we go through. Also, the stories need to take a life beyond the platform itself. This story, the, the idea you're selling to people, the, the brand that you want them to buy into, it needs to be something that people are talking about amongst themselves. It can't just be you telling what's going on. It needs to be, the, the story itself needs to become much broader. Now, this is the way that the sector, uh, the creative industries generally is moving. Um, there are exceptions to everything and there'll be some that, that, that won't see this, but by and large, this is the kind of route that everybody's starting to take. 
And I think what's really important about that is it throws up a whole new area of measurements that we should be and can be looking at. Working for an economic development agency for the government means that you automatically are looking at jobs and turnover. Now, if you take the creative sector, that's immediately a nightmare because creative businesses, by and large, don't employ lots of people. They collaborate and work together to create scale, to get new skills, access um, to, to new markets, new knowledge brought into the business. When the project's finished, that 100 people they may have worked with will still be de there doing other things, but they will not be employed in the business. So when you're seeing the growth pattern, it's not going the way the development agency would expect of straight up employees and turnover. It's going in a kind of diagonal direction where the size of the sector is creating the growth. It's the size of the networks you can access and how you use those. And that in itself then is this whole idea of the networking is, is the important measure that we really need to be paying more attention to. How well networked are you and how do you effectively use those? So as I said, so when you watch the growth there, even if a company takes on businesses, eh, sorry, takes on employees, by and large the employees will drop out and come back to the network stage because they want to do their own creative work within, um, within the sector rather than stay with a single business. So again, we, um, you, you have this spiral of growth across the, the board. What it does though is also leaves you with the challenge of how do you then manage those relationships and the plug-in services that any business is going to require, especially when a lot of those services are much larger and provided by multinationals or provided by much larger suppliers than your own business. So suddenly you're, you're, out, you're out balanced. It's, it's a difficult um, balancing trick to get the service delivered the way you want it and not be swamped by your supplier. So, as I was saying, what we've been talking about is, or I've been trying to say, is that if we move to this idea of taking story, it works well for museums, it works for businesses, it can work for pretty much anything. What is your story? What's the brand? What are you trying to, to put out the meeting for and get people to engage with? In the old kind of format that people have been using, you'd start here where the, you have a predetermined product. It might be a film. It could be a game, it could be a bit of music, whatever it is that you started with. And you work your way down to finally having some engagement with the audience, which when you think about it, seems really quite incredible that there should, there's virtually no audience engagement or participation until you reach the very final part of it. You're also then talking about a huge risk. You're talking about years to develop from there to there with the, with the potential of no returns at the end of it. So again, this is a real challenge if you're, going to, if you're looking at how you support a creative business, if they're sticking with this format, what are we going to measure them on? We can't measure them on the basis that they've got an idea that might be good or it might be bad. Um, they can't predict what their sales are going to be. They can't, with any real setting, tell you very much about what they're going to do until they reach these last sections. So what we're encouraging businesses to do and also to, that allows new ways of measuring the, the, the impacts and what's happening with the, in the sector is to take a slightly different approach and to look at a more people-centric model where instead of having the film or the platform sitting in the center, we're actually talking about the story. The brand sits at the center. And what we're encouraging folks to do is start looking around at what are all the other options? What are the possibilities that you, can, t you can, can use to get your product out to an audience. So instead of saying a film, let's say we might start off by doing an app or developing a game which tests the characters in the film. It puts them out to, to a wider audience immediately. People are then asked to engage with that in, in different, different ways. But you find out, do the characters work? You find out how people to react to elements of your story. Are they going to buy into the, to the brand or not? But what you can also do is start to generate income from all of these different elements long before you hit the stage of your film. So your production process is faster, your testing and your innovation is done faster, and you either succeed or fail much more quickly and at a lower cost. And if you're succeeding, you can be generating income at the same time. And I think what, what becomes interesting with this, this kind of idea and this approach is that when you look at... Um, some of the museums and things, you know, a lot of you were talking about museums there. Um, I had 
well, somebody put in a, a, a site for a big museum in, in the States, and we're saying, this is an incredible um, website. It gives you fascinating amounts of information. It's absolutely brilliant. But when you looked at it, you discovered the only folk that used it regularly lived within 15 miles of the museum. Because effectively, what it was was a website of what's in it. Well, that's, the building itself is the least accessible asset that you're sitting on. So what, are, what is the actual story? What is the brand you're selling? What are you getting people to buy into? And what are the alternative routes that you can use to start generating um, ideas and, and, and income around it? And I think one, uh, it isn't it's just having um, you mentioned about museums and things. One, one example I would suggest that you might want to have a look at is uh, fortmcmoney.com, which was a project that was developed by a Canadian production company, Canadian Broadcasting and Arta, which was actually looking at Fort McMurray, who obviously now have their own challenges and a very different set of challenges they've been facing. But it was around getting folk to engage with the environmental issues. And what was done was a documentary and a game and other, and other products that brought people in to create that discussion and getting it moving. And I think it, it, it's quite an interesting one for, particularly if you're looking at cultural and heritage things, it's about engaging that discussion and how you can get, motivate people to, to be a part of the, of the process. Um, just in case you're really bored, that's where I'm going on holiday next. Um, to give a couple of examples then, and, and hopefully see something about the measurements that we, we, we are looking at. Um, Rachel Sermani is a singer-songwriter from Carbridge. She's self-managed. Um, she did have a small local label that she was putting this, her albums out on, but pretty much does everything for herself. Um, under the account management system that enterprise agencies tend to use, looking for high growth and huge turnover increases, job um, employment things, she wouldn't get a look in. It just, it's not going to happen. But what we have got is a very profitable business. What she does, and does really effectively, is uses her, the social media. She has her own voice comes across in that. It's the way that she talks to people, the way she sells herself, and the world that she's inhabiting. Her own artwork goes in, her music goes in, and, and she uses that, as I said, incredibly effectively to engage with people and get them to follow up on the actions. As a result, what we found is that she's not big in, in the, the big markets like the US, something like that isn't the target ones that she, she's really picked up on. But where she has been really successful is India, in Spain, Portugal, Germany, the Netherlands, Canada. Now, Canada is quite big, but most of these are fairly, well, India is a huge market, but the others are fairly small markets themselves. <coughs> but by combining them, she has an enormous market. And the other thing is, she can fill reasonable sized venues now because of that continual engagement and people talking about her. So again, it, it's about the authenticity, the personalization of the conversation that you can push in. But how does the development agency measure that fact, that personalization of the, 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 the processes and personalization of the, the activity she's doing and the, the engagement with people? Um, moving on to another one is business to business sales. Um, again, if you get a chance, have a look at the, um, the Facebook site for uh, Groove Karen Gorm. It's a new dance festival that's started up in the Highlands. And one of the big things there is that they need to be armed with a certain amount of data about the kinds of people that are going and the numbers. And also, they want to have large numbers of folk viewing their site. But in this context, what we're really talking about and is how they are using their products to service brand alignment. What, what do other companies want out of it? It's not about going for sponsors. The, the a kind of older model of how you would engage with folk by bunging their logo onto the leaflet or the posters. This is really about saying, how much money can I get from the company? And also, what other services do these bigger brands offer that I can make use of to drive my audiences and, and drive it through? And what they're looking for is the unique content that can go on their websites. Their marketing departments generally have plenty of cash, but what they don't have is that unique content, the, the feel, the color, the sense of place, the things that smaller local localized products can offer, something that has a real USP in where they're from or in the types of service that they're offering. 
Um, and so again, what you're talking, what they're talking about there is they have now have a, a number of major brands who've come on board and are now providing a range of services to the festival as well as financially buying in because this is giving them content. You can see the kind of images they've got, the video that, sh that is attracting the kind of consumers that they want to engage with. And the last one, right, I will say that I'm not necessarily saying that this is the greatest film and that you want to watch the film, um, although somebody from the University of Helsinki, I should say it's a finished one, therefore I'm sure it's great, and just to get that point. But I think what really is worth looking at is how the community was built around this project, because it's, it's a really smart bit of work that um, Timo has done here. It's, it started off that he made a very low budget film where he set up a website where folk could volunteer special effects services and help with the film that they were trying to develop. And he built up enough on that that they completed the film, then they gave it away online for nothing, then he started selling it. And they started selling other products around it that were part of the concept of this science fiction world that he was creating. By doing that, he generated a vast amount of interest and loads of people that were wanting to take part. They created them a video for the next film, which was Iron Sky, about Nazis on the moon invading Earth. Um, but what he did know was what were the kinds of things that these science fiction fans would buy into? What were they interested in? Because he knew that audience really well. And most importantly, he was able to, to not only do crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, crowd investment, but also pulling in um, all sorts of support in it, but he was also able to get folk to sign up saying, show the film here, which the result of that meant that he was able to go to all of the, the, the different territories and distributors and pre-sell the film in all territories prior to it being made. So again, it was about that understanding of, of the audience and being able to use the data and being able to measure exactly what the potential was out of that. They've now moved on to the second film, uh, Iron Sky, The Coming Race, which adds dinosaurs into the mix as well. And I gather you, you could buy things like being eaten by a dinosaur for $5,000 as part of the, the process. Now again, I accept that being eaten by a dinosaur isn't necessarily a selling point for all of you. But what I'm, what I'm getting is it's about that understanding of what was required to do it. Um, certainly he's generated the, the millions that are required to allow this film to go ahead. And what he's now done is set up the Iron Sky franchise or franchise, sorry, which is about getting people to bring new content built on the world of Iron Skies. So it's about games, it's graphic novels, it's books, it's anything that they, that they can use to sell the concept of the world more, wild, more widely. Anything that fits within that created world, within the story, is, is useful and is fair game and can be used to help drive stuff forward and, and, and move the next one. And they're in talks now in China with, um, over financing the third film that's um, being planned on, on this one. So after Dinosaurs, I'm not sure what, where you could go next. But as I said, have a look at the websites because it's a really fascinating bit of work and really cleverly done, even if the film is not necessarily to your, your taste. So just to finish off, what I would say there is that I, hopefully you can see connections across the, the presentations that we've already had. There is this requirement for data, but there's a bigger requirement not only for the, the data and the information to come in, it's about how we also get the story across of the value of the creative sector, the value of cultural activity. Um, that's a much bigger engagement, I find, than actually being able to give figures for public sector agencies, for funders, for investors. Getting the message over that there's a value in it itself is the first step. It's not the project having value, it's actually getting them to engage with the sector in the first place that creates that challenge. And so how do we if it more effectively use that, that idea, get the story out? And also, it's about en encouraging small businesses who naturally understand they have to collaborate to create scale, but don't naturally collaborate with people that don't work in the same area as them. Musicians always talk to musicians, filmmakers talk to filmmakers, writers talk to writers. But actually, we need all of those to be crossing over each other rather than directly um, to the, the folk doing the same kind of work as themselves. And I think where organizations like our own need to start getting smarter is to start measuring the, the potential 
that some of these networks and these um, this wider story storytelling and the perceptions that that's, that that brings. Um, what's the impact on the Highlands and Islands by all these businesses going out and selling the region in some form or another? What's the, the impact of um, being tied in with multinationals in different countries or being um, connected to writers and filmmakers in other countries? And we really don't pick up on that. And we also don't look at then what's the wider story you can attach to it by how does food and drink fit into that? How does other cultural topics fit within those? And um, whereas that idea of jobs and turnover seems a very restricted message. That's really what I wanted to say. I'm sorry, I kind of feel I've just thrown a whole lot at you. But, um. Here we go on about the ref and our own little uh, kind of ivory tower and it was important to look from a government agency perspective. This issues of job growth and uh, economic value, it was very reassuring for me to see that they don't have all the answers and actually it's again about the value culture and also again this theme of intersections and uh, and networks and bring people together to talk and discuss this rather than necessarily having all the answers about the country. Um, I know that we only have one more speaker and you're probably going to retire, but we have space for a few questions for any of you have now before we can collect them together at the group work afterwards. Can, can I, sorry, so, I, sorry, Andrew Gregg and Pastoral Art, but I just want to go back to the title of your talk, which yeah. I know these things change when you actually sit down and write a piece. But you say putting the client, who is the client well, exactly? Ag again, the client, so the client varies depending on which standpoint you're in, which part you do. Um, for HIE, our client is other business, is businesses that we're supporting. So we need to put them at the centre of the story to make it clear how this, how this works, if, how the support works. If you're a business trying to sell your product, you need to put the, the client you're selling to needs it to be at the core of it because they need to have input and engagement if you're going to really make any kind of um, real steps forward with it. If it was a museum or um, a, a gallery, you're talking about the kinds of the people that are going to come and engage with you in the gallery. And the point with those, all of those, is that we shouldn't make the assumption that it's one small group of people that that's, this is the whole object of moving things out into a much wider sphere and looking at how the story can be spread much further and engaging a much wider group of a client base or customers or consumers or fans. Because um, effectively, those fans or followers are the new currency. That's what you're working in, is about bringing people to engage with you. That was an interesting point about terminology and um words we use, maybe use a community of visitors in other contexts, yeah. but also thinking of the economic impact there as well. And often your client is your funder, actually, yeah, if yes. you're running a project, <coughs> Absolutely. you're certainly yes. your funder's aims. Yeah, yes. As well as your customers. Yes. <laughs> oh. Ian, in your experience, do you think that boring academics like me and academic institutions understand this fully and are engaging with it fully? Um, there's a mixed answer to that. The answer generally is yes, that the academic institutions that I've come across do understand it. But we have a, a bit of a problem in Scotland that there is not enough engagement between creative businesses and academic institutions um, because they speak two different languages. And so I, I, I regularly hear folk working in the creative sector complaining that um, it's too slow if you work with a, with an academic institution or um, what they're doing that's not going to create any jobs. Well, two things on that. One is, it's only as slow as it has to be. I mean, you, you, projects can move at any, whatever speed they require. But the other one is, I know virtually nobody working in the creative sector who is employed. They're all freelance. So again, this idea of creating jobs in the legs is a bit of a, a nonsense. It's a red herring because that's not how the sector works. Um, th there are also create opportunities because there's research and things that can be done. You know, again, looking at some of the work that you've all been, you've been doing, there's some really valuable information there potentially about how we measure some of the impacts and the way we're working. But also, um, if you look at what well, was pointed out to me recently, that France um, is particularly poor in its engagement between academic research and business. And that Scottish Development International can see that there's an opportunity for selling 
Scotland for international businesses on the basis of that connection to uh, academia, well, that seems to me a huge area of opportunity that is not being explored. It's certainly not, I'm not aware of it. And I think there's huge things that could be done, a huge amount, if we were just a little bit better at joining up rather than... Yeah, well, you, you could be a, I mean, your organisation could be a huge benefit to us because, for example, I, I presume it's the same in Scotland, our graduate progression is measured as to whether or not people are in full-time post or not. Yeah. Well, in the creative sector, they're not going to be. Yeah. But it's just a matter of many things. We tell our funders that they don't, but, but if it was coming from both of us, that might well, help. I'm happy to yeah. do anything to help with that to count me in for those ones. But, but I think it would be really interesting is it, to follow up because I'm certainly aware that our measurements are pretty naff by and large. That we, we are very restricted because you're delivering a government's economic development policy. No matter how you dress it up, that's, that's what it is. We would just like to be able to say that, to, to emphasise the importance of some of these other measures and how the, the wider impact is, is much more significant than that direct economic impact that you would see. I think that's a wider point coming and came from the last portion. We need to be much more flexible. We're skimming the surface, not just in Europeana, but also in other things when we're measuring things uh, in very set and kind of traditional ways. We need much more flexibility. Right, thank you very much. Thank you.